Alors, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. That's about all the French you're going to get out of me for a while. <laughs> But welcome. Today we're going to talk a little bit uh, in a short time about the French and Indian War, some of the causes and uh, some of the, the war, just a little bit about the war and then about the uh, what the results of the war. Now, actually, the French and Indian War that at goes between 1754 and 1763 uh, was the fourth of the Indian Wars. Actually, I think there's six of them all together. Uh, before that, the, one of the very early ones before 1700 was King William's War. Uh, it went on for almost uh, nine years, and nothing happened when they got done with it. Everybody went back to the same boundaries they had before. It was followed shortly by the Queen Anne's War. And uh, this one did start changing some of the, the land ownership. Britain got Hudson Bay, Acadia, Newfoundland. Uh, France kept Cape Breton and the St. Lawrence Islands, which was important to them. Then, so all these wars are kind of going on. And then the, later on in 1744, they have King George's War. And during that war, France or Great Britain got Louisbourg, which is the famous fort that's on a, uh, that faces the Atlantic. But after the war, the Treaty of 1748, they got Louisbourg back. And again, then all the borders go back to where they were to begin with. So they do this fighting and nothing really happens uh, major. But also England got some Madras in India. So it, this is kind of the beginning of a world war. We always think of World War I, but you're going to hear about World War Zero, which is coming up. Well, then I assume then that the French had Madras in India? Yeah, they had property over there or land that was, was theirs. Uh, Britain, I mean, it's pretty amazing, and you'll see some uh, maps later on when we really get to the, the war. So. This is kind of what's happening in America. Those are those wars I just talked about, King William's, Queen Anne's, and then King George's. But while this is going on here, there's wars going on in Europe. Uh, first, the War of the Grand Alliance, followed by the Sp War of Spanish Succession, and then the War of Austrian Succession. And that was a major one, because uh, that really involved uh, a lot of different countries. And what really gives the, the uh, term World War Zero to this period. Now one of the things you, you look, and I mentioned that the, we always, a lot of times you will hear that the French and Indian War is also called the Seven Year War. Well, that's not exactly what happened, and we'll explain it a little bit. The, the French and Indian War started in 1754. The uh, Seven Year War started in Europe, or was declared in Europe in 1756. So it's, They're not really truly synonymous, though we, we tend to do that. So what are some of the causes for the French and Indian War? And I'm going to be talking primarily about America or North America at this point. One of them was, again, a, a European uh, uh, imperialism. Uh, these countries wanted to be the top dog. And one of the things that made them a top dog is how much land did they have and which countries did the, uh, rep were their colonies. But one of the major reasons why it happened in America, you know, the French and the, uh, and the British, all those wars that I talked about before, the French and the British were at each other in, in Europe. So now they're going to be at each other in, uh, you know, in what is now the United States. And what you see here, these are the 13 colonies. France, or Spain has Florida at that point. And then you see the French is the blue. And... Um, In between down here with this shaded area and up here, these were contested lands. The colonists, the 13 colonists, colonies really wanted to go into the Ohio Valley. And uh, that was French territory. And so that's, the, the, the Britain was getting all this pressure from the, the colonists to say, we want to move beyond the Allegheny Mountains. So that was really the, the cause for the French and Indian War. Some of the events that happened before that, you know, France is, uh, New France is major, or the, centered up in Quebec and Montreal. Um, they had all this country down here, the Ohio Valley. Uh, they had um, what we call the Illinois country, which is where we're at with on either side of the river, the Potawatomi. Uh, 
But in 1749, de Blainville goes down and he claims the whole Ohio region for France. And that went all the way to the Allegheny Mountains. That irritated Britain. They didn't like that. The other thing that the French did is they started making alliances with the Native Americans that lived in the Ohio Valley. And most importantly, they started establishing forts. Uh, we had a major fort across the river, Fort Deschart, which started about 1719. I think it was probably in the 1730s that it went, became a stone fort. I think there were four of them over there all together. But some of the, in 1750, they established a fort at Toronto. Uh, 1751 Presque Isle, and then um, just south of, uh, I think it's south of the Ontario, uh, Fort Le Boeuf and Fort Venago. And then most importantly, in 1753, they established a small fort at the forks of the Mon Monongahela and the Ohio, which is now Pittsburgh. So you have three rivers coming together there. And, it, and so they established Fort Duchenne. And typically, uh, of the French forts, and even like Fort de Chart, you will see these kind of fort uh, configurations, where you have a, a square with little buttresses. I can't remember the, the French, you remember the French guy's name that was designed forts? He was a very famous guy, and I just, could be. I d yeah, and I, everybody liked his fort design, so they kept doing it. And the reason you had these little projections, so when people are coming this way, they can shoot down on them from the side. Uh, a lot of times they would build outside the fort little, little revetments and things, which you, which you see here. But this was, this was a major irritation to uh, Britain. So, governor of Virginia, uh, Din, Dinville, he sends this young guy named George Washington to go out and throw the, the French out of Fort Duchenne. So he takes off and he, gets, he doesn't get all the way to Fort Duchenne, he gets to about right here, which is in the lower corner of, of uh, Pennsylvania. And the first thing, there was a little skirmish. There was a group of about 50 French that came out to find out what Washington was all about. Well. The Americans in Washington capture this, this little troop, and the guy named uh, Jumonville, uh, Washington was trying to interrogate him, and one of the Native Americans killed him right there. And uh, so uh, Washington realized that that irritated the rest of the French in the area, and so he started to head back towards where he came from in Virginia, but first he builds a fort and it's called Fort Necessity. He knows he's in trouble. So he builds this little round fort with just a little thing in the center. And if you go to the Fort Necessity, you can see how small this is. And he made a major problem. This fort was surrounded by woods on both sides, and it was within musket range. So the French could um, stay in the woods, the Native Americans that were allies, with him could stay in the woods and take pot shots. Well, eventually, uh, Washington su surrenders. He, they say it's the only battle he lost. There's a couple of times he retreated, like across from in, in uh, New York and, and uh, probably Boston with the uh, Battle of Bunker, Bunker, Bunker Hill. It's also called the Battle of Great Meadows. So this is 1754, and this is like the first shots that are fired this is like our Lexington and Concord, but for the, the uh, French and Indian War. So Washington goes back. I think he's like a captain or a lieutenant at the, at the time. He goes back and he tells the governor, hey, uh, I think we can take the fort. So in 1755, they send General Braddock. And he takes off from Virginia, and he builds a road. He's got this big troop, and he keeps building roads. And he gets about, he has to go through the Alleghenies on the red line. He goes past Fort Necessity, and you can see how far away that was from Fort Duchenne. And he gets about 10 miles from Fort Duchenne. And Washington, according to what you read about it, kept telling Braddock, watch these guys. They don't fight like we fight. The Brits line up in a, in a line, and they do volleys, and then the guys behind them do a volley while the front line is, is loading. And, it, and Washington's telling this guy, that's not how they fight. They fight from the woods. They fight like savages, like savages. 
which is what the French called the, the Native Americans. So he is strung out along this road, and the Native Americans and the French attack him. And he tries to retreat, and on the retreat, Braddock is killed. He's shot and killed. Uh, it's called Braddock's uh, Expedition. I think it's got some other names like Brad, uh, Braddock's Disaster or something like that. He just didn't do very good, and they did not kick the French out of Fort Duchenne at this point. While this is going on, if you remember, I said in about 1756, uh, the Seven Year War is starting in Europe. Well, it was kind of preceded by that War of Austrian Succession that went from 1740 to 1748. And this was, a, a, this was truly, it ended up being a world war. Uh, in this War of Austrian Succession, uh, Aust Austria lost this little area here called Silesia and um, to the Prussians. And so that kind of, the, the Germans didn't like, the Prussians didn't like that. So they, it kept being an irritation there. So it eventually gets into a conflict. And this is the, the Seven Year War, the World War Zero. And there was a lot of alliances in Europe. I mean, there's some traditional enemies, France versus England, Spain versus England. But you see on one side, France, Austria, Spain, Sweden, and Russia, which is uh, now on the Asian uh, continent, versus Prussia, Britain, and Portugal. But there was also conflicts related to South America, to India, and Africa. And when you look at what happened after the war, who got what, it truly was the First World War. Um, Austria kept refusing to, uh, the refusal to recognize the loss of Silesia. About the same time, Britain was seizing French ships in the North Atlantic. And then on May 17th, uh, England declares war on uh, France, and that is the beginning of the Seven Year War. Back to America, uh, both the French and the, and, the, and the British made alliances with different tribes of Native Americans. Uh, on the one side, the British had the Iroquois Confederacy, the Cherokee Nation for a while, and the Catawbas. The um, Iroquois Confederacy is like right here south of the St. Lawrence River. Uh, the, the French had the Wabanaki Confederacy. Um, I think that, I'm trying to remember where that was. I think that was up in, kind of in, in this area here. But they had the Kanawaga Mohawks, the Algonquins, uh, uh, Ojibwe's, the Lenape, the Ottawa, Shawnee, and the, and the Wendat Nation. And the Wendat Nation is kind of north up here. The, in the, we typically call them Hurons but they, it, they were wine, typically called wine dots in, at the time period. So this was very important because Britain didn't have that many soldiers and they didn't have that many uh, militia, uh, the citizen soldiers. France even had less soldiers uh, in, and population in, in a lot of these areas. So it was important that these alliances with the Native Americans, because they would go along, they would be scouts, they would, they would fight, and they actually taught the French how to fight like savages. So talking a little bit about, well, I'm not gonna go into every battle. Uh, the French really won, only won two battles in the, the whole French and Indian War. The first was uh, in 1756 here at, uh, this is kind of a poor picture, but Fort Oswego, which is on the southern uh, or eastern end of Lake Ontario. And uh, their general who commanded that, that uh, expedition from <laughs> Quebec was Montcalm, the, the Marquis de, de Montcalm. And then the next year in 1757, he attacks Fort William Henry, which is on Lake George, up in uh, upper New York, and captures that fort. So here we are, the, the French are kind of starting off good and winning the first battles. Unfortunately, the tide turns. Um, the British started having uh, victories. The first one was kind of a, a small one for Beauséjour. I guess that means good day or something like that. Or not good day, but happy day, beautiful day. Uh, again, it's a typical French fort. And it, at this time, a, a lieutenant colonel uh, commanded the uh, British ex expedition that captured them. Then 
Fort Duchenne, again, was high on the list of what the Brits wanted to, to uh, take, and so they sent a guy named Forbes, who took a different route than Braddock. Uh, he went a little further north. I don't think he built a road to get there. But in 1757, they attack Fort Duchenne and actually capture that fort, and it becomes British. And in 1758, the perennial fort that's fought over all the time, Louisburg, is captured by a, a British general named Amherst. And in 1759, Fort New Niagara, which is up on near Niagara Falls, and I know the, our captain's been there before, uh, that fort, that they still have uh, most of these places, other than think uh, Fort Duchenne, I don't know if they still have a model or a replica they do of that. But uh, a guy named, a French guy was a, a, a French named general for the Brits who actually captured Fort Niagara, and that was Prideaux. Then the, yes? You know, Fort Niagara, known to the French as Fort Caroline, they actually won the first battle, is when they, is when they turned back the British. Uh, the Black Watch were massacred there. But, but you're absolutely correct. In the end, the British did. Take Fort Niagara. The major battle of the war was when uh, Wolfe went up to capture Quebec. And he comes up, and Quebec is kind of down here, but uh, kind of downriver is this big area, uh, and it was had kind of like a bluff there, a hillside. And he had the, Brit the Brits went up there. I mean, they sent ships down, uh, I guess it's up the St. Lawrence. <coughs> and they went past uh, Quebec, and he had his soldiers climb these bluffs. And it said like they were using trees and roots to get up there. It kind of reminds me of D-Day in Omaha Beach when you read about what the Rangers did trying to get up those bluffs at, in uh, France. But so he gets up there, and he starts over what is called the Plains of Abraham. And actually, I think Montcalm and his people outnumbered the Brits at this point, along with all of his militia. But Montcalm, in spite of his victories earlier in the war, didn't actually do a good job of defending Quebec. And so you have in, in red the different uh, groups of the Brits heading there, and then you have the, the various uh, French groups. And by the way, afterwards, if you want to look at some of the the soldier outfits that these groups uh, that are listed on here, I think some of them are on the wall there as I, as I walk by. But eventually, um, Mon or Quebec surrenders. Unfortunately, during this war, the James Wolfe, the Brigadier, Brigadier General for the Brits, gets shot and killed during the war, or during the battle. And uh, so, but the, the Brits kept going and they eventually won. Uh, at the same time, Montcalm gets shot. I think he lives long enough, he lives a day, and he actually looked at the uh, terms of surrender of Quebec and approved them. And so he dies the next day. So um, this, both of these guys were two major generals, other than I think Amherst probably did the best job of any general of all of them. But these two guys ended up dying at the Battle of Quebec. And this was really the turning point uh, for the war. Post-Quebec, there were a couple of other battles. Uh, the Brits captured uh, Montreal in 1760, and here's good old Amherst again. He's, he's doing a pretty good job. Uh, and the very last battle was in September of 1762. It's called the Battle of Signal Hill. And at this point, the, and, and, and a captain, Campbell, is the one who's leading the Brit forces there, but they end up, this is the last warfare uh, in the war that, that France now understands that they're losing. I mean, they've, had, they've lost all these major battles and, and forts. And the King of France, King Louis XV, decides he's going to do a secret treaty. And it's the Treaty of Fontainebleau. And he does it, and he cedes all of Louisiana to King Charles III of Spain. And this, it, it's not announced in the world, it is truly a secret treaty. And one of the things you notice, it's not just the area that later becomes the Louisiana Purchase, it's all that land from the Allegheny Mountains westward. So this is in 1762, right after the, you know, like a month after the Battle of Signal Hill, and 
the way it was written, it was the country known as Louisiana as well as New Orleans, which was important, and the island in which the city is situated. So then, in February of 1763, about you know, three or four months later, they all sit down and they s settle what's known as the Treaty of Paris of 1763. There's another one later on called the Treaty of Paris in 1783. But this is the one that ends the war between uh, Britain and France and all the Allies. It all, it's the end of the French and Indian War. It's the end of that seven-year war that was going on all over the world. And in it, it started formalizing territorial boundaries. It did allow French Canadians to keep practicing Catholic because most of the French were Catholic. It was a national religion. Uh, it did give, one of the things that was interesting, it gave free passage to the British all the way up and down the Mississippi. Uh, it did not allow them to do things in New Orleans, uh, which ends up being one of the major issues during the Civil War, or not the Civil War, the American Revolution, and later the uh, Louisiana Purchase. And one of the things it said, it said, okay, all the French can migrate uh, to the area west of the Mississippi. Even though when they're signing this treaty, they didn't know about that secret treaty of, of Fountainbleau. But, so that ended the war, uh, the Seven Year War. There was another treaty of Herbertsburg uh, five days later, but ended that conflict that started with the War of Austrian Succession. So everything's kind of done here. So I wanted to talk briefly about some of the impact on some of the major players. Um, when we start talking about the, uh, Great Britain, they got all of the French ter territory. Eventually they understood that it was all the territory up to the Mississippi River. Um, and they also received Florida uh, from Spain. Uh, in the West Indies they get Grenada and the Grenadines Islands from France. Here we go in, in India, France was in India, so they get some more areas uh, that the, than they had before. They received Senegal and Africa from the French, and Minorca from, from both France and Spain. So this is starting to be, uh, England is starting to be a world uh, force here. But um, unfortunately, Britain was saddled with significant debt trying to fight this war. They had to send soldiers over here, they had to pay militia, just, it was a, a big thing. Uh, and now, all of a sudden, they got all these new possessions and that was the cost and, and government to m start managing places in, in Senegal and Africa or India. Uh, so it's, it's difficult and they're not quite ready how to, to figure out how to do that. And they also resented the colonists for getting them into this war, even though they were, they were part of it, but they, they, just, they didn't like the fact. And for years, uh, they had had what was called a salutary, salutary uh, neglect style of management. It was kind of a hands-off between the, the government of Britain and the colonies. Well, this changed with the, with the end of the war. Um, it began the area of, of uh, uh, domination of Britain in Europe and again becoming a world power. Um, some, and I'm going to talk about what that change in that salutary uh, uh, neglect, what it did to the, the Americans. But one of the things, when you look at what France had before and after, they lost major territory. And they actually ended up being kicked out of North America. The presence of the French as, as being managed by France ended with, with, this, with this treaty. The one thing they did uh, uh, retain was, or, well, they did retain a couple of islands up off of, of Newfoundland, and these were important because they're very close to the Grand Banks, which was an important fishing uh, point, part for the, for the French. Um, in, in, uh, they got Guadalupe and Martinique, uh, they also got uh, in India some, uh, uh, France got a few things where they lost uh, some posts there. And in Europe, every, that war of Austrian succession, the Prussians had come in and, and Austria had come into certain areas, so uh, they agreed to let uh, that come back. But again, the French had a lot of war debt that was going to cause problems later on also. Spain, uh, you know, they had all this territory in uh, central, or central America, South America, 
and they had Spain. And I didn't even realize that Spain had control all the way to the Mississippi River. And so, you know, like uh, if anybody's ever been to St. Francisville, which is right on the eastern side of the Mississippi, they were Spanish at one time. Uh, so they get all this territory, this right in here, as part of that secret treaty of Fountain Blow. And um, they lose Florida. They get Cuba back. England had attacked Cuba and had captured it. So they got that back, and they also got Manila back in the Philippines. So again, this is a world war going on about who's going to manage what or own what. And one of the things the, the Spanish had, they always considered the French kind of a buffer area between Britain and them. And when, when all of a sudden the Brits are right across the river here, they don't have that buffer anymore. And the Brits kind of forced some of the, and the, the uh, movement of Americans, what were going to be Americans, into the Ohio Valley started pushing uh, tribes west. We started out here with Michigamias, Tamaroas, um, some Peorias, and the, the Little Osage, Big Osage. By 1800, we're seeing the Shawnee, the Delaware, uh, and, and some more of the Peorias that are getting moved out of that Ohio area towards us. Uh, it also, you know, this battle, we think of it mostly as happening in the north part of, of North America. They also had some, the Creek Indians that, uh, that worked with them were in the south and they started having trouble with the, uh, between the Creek and the Choctaw, Choctaw tribes. And that caused problems for the Spanish in, in their territory. So, you know, the, what happened was, you know, there were, there were Native Americans that sided with the French, some with the British. The ones that sided with the French were really, the Brits kind of took a lot of trouble with, or took trouble to them, uh, especially those uh, uh, ones that we talked about, the, the Wyandots and the, the uh, other confederacies. And the other thing that happened was that the uh, uh, Americans were moving into the uh, moving into British Native American territory, and then this caused uh, a lot of discontent with the Native Americans, and ended up with uh, some uh, another war Pony called Pontiac's War, and Pontiac uh, tried. I mean, he was a tough character. You ever read about him? He, I think he could have been a Comanche. <laughs> when you read about the Comanches, they were tough dudes. Pontiac was, he was, he did some pretty wild stuff. Uh, but they did sieges at De uh, Fort Detroit, uh, Niagara, and Pitt, but didn't capture them. But they did capture eight other forts. And you can see, like we've t some of these we've talked about before, Prescott's, Leboeuf, Venago, uh, Sandusky, Fort Miami. And so this went on for a, a short period of time. Actually, Pontiac get, gets killed at Cahokia. And that, there's a lot of legends about who shot him, who killed him. But uh, he, he, was a, he was a force. He, he was one of those guys that got a number of people to come together to fight the, the Brits. So let's talk about a little bit about the American colonies. colonies. They, they had always thought that the France was going to invade them. That's went away. They're now, France has no power in, the, in North America. But the Britain, with that change from the salutary neglect, starts managing the, the uh, uh, colonies a lot more. And one of the things they did in 1763, right at the end of the war, they did a proclamation that established this boundary at the Allegheny Mountains and said that the American colonists, the British colonists, could not move past there which really irritated the colonists who fought in the war, and they fought because they wanted to move into the Ohio Valley. So this was a major irritation to the Americans. The other thing that happened at that time, Britain said, we're going to station 10,000 troops in North America. And you guys cost us a lot of money in the war. We're going to increase your taxes. And so they started passing tax acts. The Currency Act of 1764 said they couldn't use paper money. They had to use the coin of the realm. Then the Sugar Act, which is taxes on that. Then another one in 1756, the Quartering Act. They had these 10,000 troops. They're supposed to be in barracks and stuff. But, if, but it says, but if they can't be in barracks, if there's not enough room, they're going to be in the colonist homes, which irritated the colonists again. 
Then in 66, the Declaratory Act and the 1767 Townshend Act says, we can do anything we want <laughs> to the colonies, which really irritated the, 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 the American colonists. The one thing that uh, the French and Indian War showed the American colonists was that they could get together against a common foe. Before that, they were 13 separate colonies. You've got to remember, these things were founded by the, the Dutch, the, the English, the uh, different groups. The, you know, Maryland is uh, Catholic. They, they really were separate groups. We think of this join or die flag as an American Revolution flag. Actually, it's a 1754 flag or symbol that Benjamin Franklin drew. But this was, this, this was kind of, this and the taxes, not being able to move into the Ohio Valley, and uh, knowing that they can now band together is going to bode Ill, Ill for, the, for the, uh, Britain later on in the American Revolution. So I'm going to kind of finish with what happened here. All of a sudden, we're Spanish on this side of the river. We didn't know it. And we didn't know it for a couple of years. And then all of a sudden, we had all these Americans on the other side who the, the French here didn't like because they drank hard liquor. They were rowdy. Uh, I think uh, even uh, J.B. Valley called them vagabonds. Um, so, I mean, they really weren't looked on very favorably, though we did have some of them had, had come over to our side. In fact, in 1779, our militia had, out of 175 guys, we had 15 English, or Bostonese as they're called. But so, uh, one of the things that happened, so the French on the other side of the river in Kaskaskia, Cahokia, uh, the Fort Chart area of Prairie de Rocher, all of a sudden, they didn't want to be British. That was the mortal enemy of, of France. So they were allowed to move across the river. They didn't know they were moving to a Spanish area. But it had a significant effect on the population of St. Genevieve, and even more so for the fledgling town of St. Louis, which was founded in 1763, right about this same time. So there's people from Cahokia moving over, people from Kaskaskia, and they're French-speaking, they're Catholic, and they're going to kind of retain that, fr that French character. So in the past, we had, a, we had a colonial militia, but we also had across the river Fort Deschart, which had detachments of Marines that I don't think they ever fought on this side of the river, but they were always there. But all of a sudden, I, I, and that's something I need to ask somebody, what happened to the Marines between when uh, the treaty was signed and when the, the Brits took over two years later? I guess it was the 42nd. Uh, Highlanders came in under Captain Sturley to take charge of the fort. Were the French Marines still there? What happened to the Marines? Did they go back to Canada? Did they get out of the army? I'm, a bunch of them went to St. Louis. A bunch of them went to St. Louis. Some of them came here, too. So one of the things we started seeing here, because now we're, we're Spanish, that a lot of our documents are also in French and Spanish. The official documents start to become in Spanish. Uh, Locally, it's pretty much still French. Uh, there's still a lot of pressure from what I call the Boston, they call the Bostonese or the English to move across the river. You have the New Madrid be it, getting a grant and found, founding that, they say, the first American city uh, down there because of the, him getting that grant from the Spanish. Uh, some of the religious changes, uh, and it, some of these were not exactly related to the war. But most of the priests, or just about all the priests that were here prior to 1763 were Jesuits. And in France in 1763, there was a, a repression against the, the Jesuits. They got kicked out of France. They got kicked out of, of our area here. And so we started losing priests. And here we're Catholic. Spain's Catholic. We're all these French Catholics. Actually, one priest went down the, to uh, New Orleans, and he comes back as a Capuchin not a Jesuit. He somehow convinced them that's what he was. So that was one of the, the changes. Uh, and then we started uh, seeing, uh, you know, Protestant religions coming on. And I talked about a little bit before about this displacement of the native tribes. Again, as, as British people uh, move into the Ohio Valley, it's a lot of, lot of uh, uh, problems uh, with, with the Native Americans that traditionally lived there and they get moved west. Uh, the other thing is, is that most of the French that were here were not 
uh, the ones that did storm the Bastille, the, the Libertad, they were royalist. In fact, the little town just south of town here was called Nouvelle Bourbon, New Bourbon, after the French king, founded by a guy named uh, Pierre Charles de Halt de la Seuss de Lusier. I mean, this is a, he, he would have got his head chopped off if he would have been back in France. So when the Americans come in and they capture Kaskaskia, that, and the famous uh, patriot priest, Father Jibal, who had served in St. Genevieve before that, it was kind of like we sided more with the Americans than because they were against the Brits and we didn't like the Brits. So that was really the major impact on our area. Um, we stayed Spanish until 1800 when there was another treaty between uh, Bonaparte, uh, Napoleon, and uh, Spain, and Spain gets the territory back. And then about four years later, Jefferson sends the guys to um, France. He, what he sends them over for is to buy New Orleans. They wanted that as a major shipping point. When they get over there, they find out that uh, Napoleon wants to sell the whole thing. The one area on this side of the, uh, of the Atlantic that the French had maintained after the 1763 war was the island, a part of the island of what we now call Haiti and Santo Domingo. They owned the western half, which was called Saint Domingue, and they retained that. But in 1791, there was the first slave ups, uprising that was successful, and they kicked the French out. Uh, Napoleon sends troops back in later on to recapture it between yellow fever and malaria and the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the upstart of the slave revolt. They kick them out again. So that's kind of truly the end of the French in, in, in our side of the, of the uh, Atlantic. So that's it. La fin. The end. <laughs> and I'm not going to pronounce the bottom, but it says, alas, we now always speak English instead of French. <laughs> yep. I think, I think it was mostly in the north. I don't remember seeing any of the, the battles. I mean, there was incur, uh, incursions of, of uh, fur, British fur trappers coming into the area, which was always an irritation not only to the French, but to the Spanish later on. Um, but I don't know that the French Marines ever got in a battle. Uh, our militia was only in one, the Battle of Fort San Carlos in May uh, 1780. Uh, so there really wasn't a lot of fighting here. The first forts, I think, were all wooden forts. Uh, first three over to Chart, and then they built that wonderful, beautiful stone one, but it was right on the river, and the problem was the river started eating away, and then the French abandoned it, what, about 1770 or 1760-something? It wasn't long after they took over, 1765? They're like, there are two years, or, and then they say, that's it. Yes? So, uh, earlier on, I kind of talked to you, uh, saying on how the Seven Years' War and the French and Indian War kind of had a connection. I didn't quite catch all of that, so did the French and Indian War take seven years? Actually, it took nine years. It started before, <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we don't call it, we call it the French and Indian War rather than the Seven, seven Year War. Um, because then that'd be wrong. That would be wrong. <laughs> Is it really kind of started with that battle when, when George Washington loses at uh, Fort Necessity? It's a good question. And, you know, that's why I said you, you got to be careful when they talk about French and Indian War and the Seven Year War. They're, they were related and they occurred between the same people a lot of times, traditional enemies, but it, 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 it all got involved, but we kind of separate the two. Good question. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. How did the French and the British recruit the Indians to fight with them? Well, traditionally, the French, the French looked at Native Americans slightly different than the Brits did. And they looked at them as trading partners. Uh, the Brits used them to fight and to be scouts. Uh, and so that I think there was a long tradition. You know, the, 
these areas that we talked about, so, here's good old St. Genevieve and its original down here right on the river. Across the river up the Kaskaskia uh, Peninsula about a mile is Kaskaskia. Here is uh, Fort de Chart, Port uh, Prairie de Rochers uh, right there. Up above at the top is Cahokia. Most of these, I think just about all these settlements except Fort de Chart is, were founded by priests coming down, Jesuit priests. They were called black robes because they wore black, came down and tried to convert the Indians to, to Christianity. Uh, a lot of them got killed doing that. Uh, that the Na Native Americans didn't accept that. But they had had a long time working with the, the Native Americans, having people out amongst Native Americans. Um, a lot of French people that went out into the do fur trapping and things like that ended up marrying Indian Native American wives. They might have had a, a wife back in Saint Louis or Saint Jean Vier, but. Uh, so there was those kind of relationships that were going on. Um, and, and I think there was a lot, that was a lot better than what the Brits were doing with the Native Americans. Uh, you know, it, a lot of times they had fought a lot of these tribes to settle the areas. And they had bought their land for cheap, you know, $24 for Manhattan. Um, and th so there was this resentment of the Brits taking over the, the, uh, the Native American land. So that's, that's kind of, the, there's kind of a difference in how they did it, but they, the Brits knew they needed to have Native Americans help them, because they, again, they didn't have enough soldiers, and two, they didn't have maps and GPS and all that good kind of stuff and satellites to figure out where to go to fight, fight these people. On, yeah. on that question, uh, the French were here to stay. They were they intermarried with the Indians and they did not want to displace the Indians. That was the big difference between them and the British. They they just wanted they came in, you know, we just want to live with you, we want to work with you, trap, hunt. And they were here to stay, the French were here to stay, they're not going back to France. The British soldiers, on the other hand, came in. They're not here to stay, they're here to conquer. So the the British uh, settlers in the colonies can now go west. That was the big deal with the line of 63 to appease the Indians. Right. Hey, we're not going to let them go past the Alleghenies. Here's the line. Okay. But once the British won the war, they pretty much looked at all their native allies and said, thanks a lot for helping us. Time for you to move on. We're <laughs> taking over. Whereas the French, they're here to say, we just want to live with you. Farm, hunt, fish. Whereas the British were here to conquer, and once they've conquered, they bring in their settlers, and then the army moves out, and and that's and it was not a, it was not uncommon for the Indians to jump sides in the middle of the battle. <laughs> they started off with the French, the French, but hey, the British win this battle, move over to the British side, and and they pitted each other against each other. Well, you'll give us all these items guns, iron pots to fight for you. Then they'll go over to the British and say, okay, the French offered us this. What, you, what can we do to beat that deal? And they played them back and forth. And there, and there were traditional enemies between the various Native American tribes, too. Absolutely. That the French and Brits took they advantage of. They were fighting each other. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Okay. And, and then also, when everyone left, when the French left here, the wealthy French, that's what really got St. Louis kickstarted with, with finances. Otherwise, we might have the arch up on top of the bluff here. <laughs> <laughs> One leg longer than the other. Because <laughs> really, the land of the land is very similar to Omaha, across the river from Omaha, be at Council Bluffs, this exact same layout. So, uh, but all the money went to St. Louis, and all the poor people stayed here, or yeah. came across the river. And, we still are here. The, the St. Louis people called us misere, misery. <laughs> and we called them pancor, short of bread or without bread, because we'd have to send them wheat. My favorite was, they call, I think they called Kaskaskia poulet, lousy, and like a louse. Yeah. And they called Carondelet vide pouche, empty pockets. And I always say, since they got a, a gambling boat there, it's now empty pockets again. So. <laughs> I thank you all for coming, and I think uh, Stephen Kling is going to introduce you to how to play a game called the French and Indian War. That's right. We're going to take a five-minute break.